We're going to talk about the Jewish wedding. The Bible talks about a lot of weddings, the bridegroom, the bride, and all that. So this session I'm going to focus on how a typical Jewish wedding uh, looks like. I borrowed some of the material from other scholars and other uh, theologians. So this is not original to me, but uh, I did some research on that with uh, what the material others have used. So with that, let's get into the topic. So the outline for this class is what a marriage proposal looks like and what is the price of the bride. And then we are going to see the betrothal, uh, the drinking of the wine, marking the new covenant. And then we are going to see to prepare a place in the Father's house. What does that mean in relate to the John's gospel? And then we are going to see the bride spends her time learning and watching. Um, so these are just the outlines so we are going to uh, go in detail. And then groom designates a close friends to assist him as witnesses. And then groom comes back uh, for his bride with great fanfare trumpets. And then the wedding ceremony and the bridal chamber and wedding or banquet to begin. So these are the topics we're going to study. So some of this will parallel with the word of God, how these things are related. So the first thing is the betrothal. So if we look at the, the first a major step in a Jewish wedding was a betrothal. So you remember the Mary and Joseph, they were betrothed. And in that kind of a custom, you cannot just separate without a divorce. So it's more like a marriage, but it's the first step of a betrothal. So it's having a lot of uh, value in those days. So betrothal involved the establishment of a marriage covenant. That's why Joseph was thinking I would divorce her uh, instead of just walking away. Prospective bridegroom taking the initiative. So that's what we see Jesus Christ coming down uh, into this wall. And then the prospective bridegroom would travel from his father's house to the home of the prospective bride. So that's why Jesus had to come to this earth to um, gather his bride, to purchase his bride, if you will. So there he would negotiate with the father of the young woman to determine a price, also called a mohar, uh, that he must pay to purchase his bride. So first let me just go through the, the type, how they do the, in a typical wedding, and then we'll come connect those uh, topics to the scriptures. So, so far what we have seen is the betrothal is the first step. So the bridegroom initiates, he comes to the bride's house, to talk to the father to uh, get the price for the to pay the mohar to purchase his bride. So if the father approves of the marriage, the girl is called in and they all drink the wine together. Once the bridegroom paid the price, purchase price, the marriage covenant was there thereby established. So they remember that Jesus talking and giving the wine to his disciples. So this is the marking a new covenant, he says. From that moment on, bride was declared to be consecrated or sanctified, or in other words, we talked about this, set apart exclusively for her bridegroom. So it's pretty much like a marriage, but a, that's what the betrothal is. As a symbol of the covenant relationship that had been established, the groom and the bride would drink from a cup of wine over which a betrothal benediction has been pronounced. At this point, the two are considered husband and wife. So you see the same terminology used with Mary and Joseph. So therefore take your uh, Mary to be your wife. So angel tells uh, uh, Joseph. Therefore their union can only be dissolved by divorce. But their state is still called betrothal as with Mary and Joseph. After the marriage covenant has been established, the groom would leave the home of the bride and returns to his father's house. And there he would remain separate from his bride for a period of 12 months, typically 12 months. And during this time, he would go and prepare a place. This period of separation afforded the bride time to gather her trousers to her dress and to uh, prepare for married life. The groom occupied himself with the preparation of living accommodations in his father's house to which he would bring his bride. 
So that's why you see Jesus saying, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. So it's all falls with the typical uh, Jewish wedding uh, setting. And then after the time, at the end of the period of separation, the groom would come to take his bride to live with him. The taking of the bride usually took place at night. The groom, the best man and other male escorts would leave the groom's father's house and conduct a torch light procession to the home of the bride. So wherever that is, so they just travel this. And they do that without announcing. So if they don't even take email or they don't uh, call this bride. So of course there's no email these days, but uh, it, it, they come uh, unannounced. So, but what happens is, although the bride was expecting her groom to come for her, she did not know the exact time of uh, his coming. As a result, the groom's arrival would be preceded by a shout by the bystanders. So, so there the people will be watching and they proclaim, behold, the bridegroom comes. And then that gets relayed and then that gets to the, uh, the, to the bride until it reaches the bride. So that should be carried from block to block to block until they reach the bride's house. And then she started getting ready for uh, the bride and bridegroom to come. This shot would forewarn the bride to prepare for the coming of the groom. After the groom received his bride together uh, with her female attendants, the enlarged wedding party would return from the bride's home to the groom's father's house. So now they travel back again. So uh, I don't know if I have it here, but uh, what I read was, they, in fact, the bride, uh, bridegroom won't even go inside the house of the bride. So they will come out and reach and then they all go back. So if that is our thing, then that is what we are studying with the rapture pretty much. Upon arrival, the, the wedding party would find the wedding guests had uh, assembled already. So this is after the bride um, was taken up to the father's house. Shortly after the uh, arrival, the bride and the groom would be escorted by other members of the wedding party to the bridal chamber. They call it a hoopah. Prior to entering the bride, uh, the chamber, the bride remained veiled so that no one uh, could see her face. While the groomsman and the bridesmaid would wait outside, the bride and the groom would enter the bridal chamber alone. And there in the privacy of the place, they would enter into physical union for the first time, thereby consummating the marriage that had been covenanted earlier. So that's what happens. After the marriage was consummated, the groom would announce the consummation to other members of the wedding party waiting outside the chamber. These people would pass on the news of the marital union to the wedding guests. And then upon getting the good news, they will all uh, celebrate for seven days. Upon receiving the good news, the wedding guests would feast and make merry for the next seven days. So you remember in John 3, 29, John the Baptist says that I am a friend of the bridegroom, not the, the, not the bride. So, who, so we'll come to that passage later. So during the seven days of the wedding festivities, uh, which were sometimes called the seven days of the hoopah, the bride remained hidden in the bridal chamber. So seven years, the bride remained veiled. At the conclusion of the seven days, the groom would bring his bride out of the bridal chamber, now with her veil removed so that all could see who his bride was. So that is a typical Jewish wedding. So, and then let's look at the Bible verses to see how this uh, fall in line with the kind of uh, tradition they follow. So let's look at Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. It says, The Lord God said, It is not good for a man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So right from the beginning, it is a union. The, the marriage union is the one God established for um, the man, Adam and Eve, the, for people. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of man and he brought her to the man. So that's the first wedding. And when we look at Abraham, he also did the same thing. Abraham was now very old and the Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to the senior servant in the household, the one in charge of all the, that he had, put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of Canaanites among whom I am living, but will go to the country and, uh, and my own relatives and get a wife for my son, Isaac. So there you know the story that the 
Eliezer, the servant, went to um, find this uh, wife for Isaac. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So here you see the son initiating, the father initiating, sending the son to, uh, to get the bride. So here that is the concept we studied. So for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, it says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband to Christ. He's talking about talking to the church and saying that I, I promised you to one husband to Christ so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. So here the bridegroom is who? Christ. And then the bride is who? The church. So in Matthew 9, 14 to 15, it says, Then come to his, uh, to his disciples of John, saying, Why do we and Pharisees fast often, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said to them, Can the sons of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? So he, Jesus also using exactly the same language. He is saying that the bridegroom, uh, addressing himself as the bridegroom, so when the bridegroom is there, so do you mourn, do you fast? So that's not going to happen now. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them and they will fast. This is Jesus talking, so acknowledging himself as the bridegroom. So once I am taken out, then the, the church, the disciples would fast and pray. Not right now when I am with them. So the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. So John 3.29. So John the Baptist saying, so the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. Again, focusing on Jesus Christ there. And in Ephesians chapter 5, it talks about, after all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. And then he says, but I am talking about Christ and the church. So he explains about the physical union of a wife and a husband and then he just jumps and says this is the thing I'm talking about. This is exactly, uh, I'm talking about Christ and the church. So the bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. You remember earlier I said that, you know, they will wait for the bridegroom to announce and then everybody will celebrate and here and there will be some uh, French escorts with the, uh, the bridegroom. So here, who is talking about this? John 3.29. John the Baptist. John the Baptist is saying, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom, who is the friend he's talking about? Himself. John the Baptist is a friend. He is talking about the friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. When he presents Jesus, it says, Behold the Lamb of God. So that is his job. That is all his job. That's when he, he was killed, when he was beheaded. God had a purpose for John the Baptist and that purpose is to introduce Christ into this world. And when that purpose is done, John's bap, John the uh, Baptist's job is done on this earth. He fulfilled his job. So that's why he, got, uh, he was beheaded. So he, uh, here, here we see that he is happy to hear the bridegroom's voice. So that joy is mine and it is now complete. Of course, some of the things that he says is, again, uh, uh, that uh, uh, future tense, like, you know, that's going to happen in the future, but... In the past, you know, I, I talked about this near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. Every time there are some prophecies, some of the prophecies as a near fulfillment addressing that current situation. But in fact, that is also talking about a far fulfillment, which is going to happen in a grander, grander scale. So there are some things like near fulfillment and far fulfillment for some of these prophecies. And when and they came to John and said to him, Rabbi. He who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing. So to give you a background, before Jesus came on the scene, who was doing the baptism? 
John the Baptist, he started baptizing. He started telling the people, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then people started coming in droves and then getting baptized and all that. And then one day Jesus appeared on the scene and he introduced, behold, the Lamb of God. And so once that happened, after that, John, Jesus had his own disciples. So now what he's saying is, somebody is telling John, do you remember that we baptized? So that they are now baptizing. So, And John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. So you yourself me, uh, bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of, my, uh, joy of mine is now complete. So when they said that, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing. In fact, they are kind of a complaining that, you know, you are supposed to do the baptisms. You are the one who started these baptisms. But now you see they are also doing the baptism. But then John says, no, they are doing it right. Unless it is given from heaven, nobody can do these things. So my job is to introduce. I just introduced him. And now I am only a friend. That's what this passage is talking about. And then we talked about the prize of the bride. So do you not know that your bodies are the members of Christ? 1 Corinthians 6.15 And then it talks about, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Why? For you are brought with a prize. So what is the prize? The blood of Christ. So glorify God in your body. So Paul talks about this extensively in several other places. You are bought with a price. If a true believer, a Christian, always have to remember they are not their own. Because you are bought with a price. So Paul make, makes it very clear. So that's why he says that for you are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you are redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors but with the precious blood of christ a lamb without blemish or defect first peter writes about this so uh, uh, corinthians he talked about bought with a price but now peter clearly says what is the price the price is the precious blood of christ so that is how you are brought and then we talked about the covenant. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And then in Matthew 26, he talks about this new covenant. And he took a cup and gave thanks and gave to them saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many unto remission of sins. But I say to you, I shall not drink henceforth of this fruit of wine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So here you see, he gives this cup and then makes a covenant representing the bride, the church. And then he says, I'm not going to drink of it until we drink again in heaven. So there's, he makes the covenant. So the price was paid, there's the covenant. And then he talks about going and preparing a place. In my father's house are many mansions, or many chambers, or many apartments, or how whatever translation depends on the translations. Of course, KJV uses many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will receive you unto myself, that where I am you may be also. So John 14, uh, 2 to 4. So here is a very clear passage that tells about this similarities between a Jewish wedding where you have the covenant, where the price was paid, and then here is the, they drink the wine, the, cup, the, the, uh, the, uh, the wine as a covenant. And now he finally says, I'm going to the father's house. In my father's house are many mansions. If, if it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place. So I'm going to prepare a place for you. Somebody pointed this out. How long it took for God, uh, God to create the whole earth? So it took six days. So six days he created all that and seventh day he rested. So if that is the case, and now how long it has been that he is away? So how marvelous this is going to be for 2000 years and so he is working for us. 
So um, to think about that, right? So it's, it's going to be really marvelous, whatever that place is going to be. So finally, uh, and I go to prepare a place for you. I come again. That is very important. Jesus telling his disciple, I'm going and then I'm going to come again. That's the promise. And will receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. I'm sure that disciples didn't understood uh, when Jesus was saying all this, they didn't understand what he was saying because what is this? He's saying that he's going, that means he has to die or something. But then how is he going to come back? Because they never thought in their mind about the resurrection. That's why in the first place they see a lot of trouble, like, you know, what we saw. So when, when he was resurrected, then he understood, they understood what all this means. Until then, it was kind of a veiled references to them. Probably most of it they didn't understand, but they were not, uh, um, not ready to ask him probably. Or <laughs> but anyway, so Jesus already told how it is all going to happen. And then in Revelation chapter 19, again we see this. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Uh, fine linen represents, uh, stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. So how is that righteousness comes to us? So here it says, the bride made herself ready. Fine linen represents the righteous acts. So how is the righteous uh, acts or righteous deeds given to us as a bride, representing as a bride? None of our actions, none of our good deeds will amount to anything. Like, you know, it is Christ's righteousness. When we put our trust, his righteousness is given to us. Our sins were cast on him. So that's the great transaction, that's the great exchange that happened at the cross. And when God looks at us, we are full of good deeds, full of righteousness. So that's how we, our righteousness completely belongs to Christ. And his bride has made herself really fine linen, bright and clean, were given to her to wear. And how is he going to come to get the bride? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with, the, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. We studied this last week in a different uh, series. Uh, that we uh, that we that are alive that are left shall together with them be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord first Thessalonians chapter 4 we studied um, how this is all happening so Jesus Christ will come back with the shout with Archangel with the trumpet of God and we are caught up in the clouds to meet him in the air and in Matthew you see but at midnight you see that the, the wordings, uh, you know, the, the Jewish wedding, the mostly they do that at the midnight or the night. And then here again, Matthew 25, 6, it says, But at midnight there is a cry. What is the cry? Behold the bridegroom, come you forth to meet him. So even in the parables in, the, in Matthew, you see in Matthew 25, it clearly says that what is happening. But at midnight there is a cry, Behold the bridegroom. Again, representation of the Jewish wedding. And then we studied, there are a lot of things we are not going to get into detail, but they, you know, you can just go and read all these parables. So there are so much of meaning in, uh, embedded in these uh, parables related to the Jewish wedding. So when the Christ comes, you know, along with the, uh, the bride, uh, it talks about the ten virgins representing here. So let's just read these passages and then we can go from there. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take the oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in their jar jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. So one day, that is what our expected, that's the blessed hope. One day we are going to hear a cry, with a trumpet sound, in the twinkling of an eye, we will be changed, we studied that. So that's where, uh, that is what we are going to see. So then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are out. 
So the, the oil represents the Holy Spirit. So if you, if they, and then in verse 9 they said, no, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us. Instead, go those who sell oil and buy some for yourself. So one's salvation cannot be borrowed from other person's salvation. So as some, in, in some systems, they say that one person's good uh, merits can be transferred to the other person to deliver them from purgatory or whatever, you know. So that is not. So each person has, should have their own uh, oil or the righteousness that, uh, from God. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the bank, wedding banquet and the door was shut. So later the others also came, Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But the Lord replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. So the similar wording is used in other parables where some people said, have not we prophesied, have not we done all these good things for you and all that Jesus said, I never knew you. So that is clearly talking about the relationship with God. So once we are uh, again and again told that we should have a relationship with God, not a religion. So that's why it is very important um, to have a relationship with God. In verse 13, therefore keep watch. Only a person who has a true relationship with God can do that. <coughs> Keeping watch, looking for his coming is a person who really believes that he's going to come back and a person who has a relationship with God only can do that. So therefore keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. You don't know when he's going to come back, when you're going to hear the trumpet sound. And there is another parable along the similar lines of a wedding banquet. Jesus spoke to them again in parable saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a bank wedding banquet for his son. So think about this wedding banquet and those who are all called, right? And who are all called are the Jewish people in the first place. So the first message came to them. So keep that in the mind, you know, so, and then you read this. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he, said some, uh, he sent some more servants and uh, said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened calf my cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. So that's the message, to come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them and killed them. So here you see the, the idea behind what happened to the Jewish nation. So God sent so many prophets. What did they do with the prophets? They just seized them and killed them. And in Hebrews it was told about the prophet Isaiah. He was even cut asunder. That means they, put, they cut him in pieces. So the king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready. But those I invited did not come, deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite the invite to the banquet any, anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well and as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. So then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So there are several things that, that are described in this passage in a, in a fashion or told as a wedding banquet thing. So those who are called, they did not come. So God extended this invitation to everyone, so the Gentiles to come in. So you see that uh, the, the concept there. And then finally he says, people not wearing a person wear, not wearing a wedding garment represents the salvation. If the person is not having the salvation and if he is there, what is, what is the penalty for that? And the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside in the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth represents the hellfire. The, 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 punishment that's going to happen for those who reject him. So that is 
the story or uh, a parable, but it conveys all the message that uh, Jesus told us. For many are invited, but few are chosen. So the message is for open for, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his son, whoever it is for everyone. So whoever comes to him, the message is open. So the banquet is getting ready. So whoever comes to the wedding banquet, so they will be uh, uh, invited. Uh, they are all invited, but very, very few are chosen. So whoever accepts this call, whoever accepts this invitation and make themselves ready, just like the previous parable, the virgins who are ready with their oil and uh, they, they only could uh, get inside the, the banquet. So this is all about a typical Jewish wedding and how these verses in the Bible um, you know, go hand in hand with the concept of this Jewish wedding. So I think this is helpful. Thank you for watching.